Testing. Hi, everyone. So Lime sent me here today to talk about some um, drivers and the ecosystem we've created. And now I'm not here just to talk about Lime-related stuff. Basically, over the years, we've made a number of, uh, I think, things that are basically useful to the SDR community in general. I'd like to talk about it. Basically, if you're using an SDR, I think this talk's for you. And if you're creating an SDR, I think this talk's also for you. So let's get into it. Introductions. I'm Josh Bloom. If you don't know who I am, you've probably used something I've created. So back when I was doing my bachelor's degree many years ago, I did uh, GRC. I've also been involved with UHD, I've done drivers, firmware, FPGA design. Uh, the USERP 2 and NC10 was one of my favorite boards. I, just, I did a whole bunch of packet routing and uh, uh, network framing on it. It was a ton of fun. Uh, Volk, I got involved with not doing actually any kernels, but uh, the, a lot of the code generation, the architecture selection. So if you understand why I enjoy that, you'll understand why I'm doing talk about drivers now. Um, currently, I'm a maintainer of Sophie SDR, something we'll get a talk with, and the uh, Pothos uh, data flow framework. Uh, recently, I've been involved with the Lime SDR crowdfunding campaign. Maybe you've heard of that. And I've done a number of not just driver work, but demos and blogs to go along with it. And finally, I'm also active um, on Myriad RF for packaging, where we manage uh, drivers and do radio packages for the community. Um, but I have a day job, not just. And so what I do, I'm an embedded engineer at Skylark Wireless. Essentially, we're a startup, and our goal is to serve underserved communities or rural communities that don't yet have access to broadband. So our goal is to create uh, wireless nodes using Lime and RFICs to serve these communities using massive MIMO or multi-user MIMO technology. See more in the link below. Um, and my job there is basically a jack of all trades. I bring up, I do bring, I bring up boards, calibration, testing, FPGA design, kernel modules, a bit of everything. It's a startup, but it's the kind of thing we do. So, getting started. Drivers and APIs. SDRs are great. SDRs are exciting. You get it communicate over the air, over the radio waves using software, and I think that's amazing. But under every good SDR application, there's, some, there's a boring, tedious <coughs> driver sitting underneath of it. So we go to use a driver. We need to make an application. We have to choose languages. We have to choose APIs. We have to use, read the documentation. There may not even be documentation. Uh, compilers, debugging. So in general, this is something everyone has to do. We don't like to talk about it. It's not that interesting, but we're going to go into it. But drivers, why do we do it? Well, in general, it's a good idea to encapsulate functionality, to save developers time, and confusion. Nobody wants to make, uh, interact with a device and, you know, which spy register do I set? What's going on in, in, in this register bank or this I squared C? You actually want high level controls, and this is an important part of abstraction. So I want to set my gain in dB and my frequency in hertz. You know, I don't want magic byte offsets and bits and bytes interleaved. Give me samples to work with, samples and flags. And further, I don't know about your brain, but I have a memory allocation error. I don't have enough RAM in my brain, and I can't get everything in at once. So we need to compartmentalize problems and split them up in ways that make sense so we can go about our jobs and make compartmentalized pieces that are easy to test and work with. And uh, finally, abstraction, another important part of drivers. You wrote code. Now you change it a little. Do you, you know, you need a different device. There's slightly different controls. Do you copy and paste all that? Or do you realize you have a pattern and you start making, making uh, something more general that takes it, it's parameterized? This is, so this is the kind of game we have to play. So anyway, I know this is a software-defined radio, so I don't think I have to sell you on good software paradigms. Just wanted to set up the framing for the rest of the talk. So let's talk a little bit about a story. Um, in 2014, I had a problem to solve. I needed generic SDR support. I wanted to bring SDRs, uh, source and sync streaming to my new data flow framework. And I was like, I want to support most, if not all, SDR devices. I don't want to do a lot of work. I want to be able to just talk to any SDR out there, RTL, hacker, whatever. So I looked at what was going on in the market, you know, the projects on GitHub, et cetera, and I kind of noticed a pattern. Everyone was sort of pulling in, you know, a C driver here and a C driver there, and whenever a new device came on the market, you just have to go wrap it up again. Every, every time, it would be a slow sort of pace where people gradually waterfalling different drivers into their system. And <clears throat> it's a lot of duplication of effort. And two, we get a lot of different implementations. Suppose you have an application that's not interested in transmit. Well, you're going to go wrap up receive only. You're going to do it only in the way you're interested in with just the controls you're interested in. And so I want something more generic than that. 
Now, GR Osmo SDR is very good. It's very close to this. It's, it's well maintained. It's got nearly every, uh, it's got a well-defined API and nearly every C driver wrapped up into it, which I think is great. It's got a few downsides. It's a hard sell. It's, it's very massive. It pulls in libboost, GNU radio, Volk, and everything under the hood. And it's hard to say, hey, I just want to get access to some controls and some streams, but you know, you're going to need to compile this gigantic thing and pull in these huge dependencies. That's difficult. Another thing is streaming API. GR Osmo SDR was set around connecting GNU radio blocks to interface with the stream, which is really good for GNU radio, but sometimes I just want to write some code where I can read and write a chunk of samples. And that's kind of abstracted and taken away from the user in terms of this uh, GR block streaming API. So, so that's sort of what we're faced with. Oh, and further, it's sort of difficult to do high level things we want to do with timing and bursts. And so that was also a consideration. I want to make it easy to not only request bursts, but to transmit stuff at particular times. We need high level stream controls. So here's what I was thinking. I'm, I see a problem in the community. I have a problem I want to solve myself. Let's make a framework. What are we going to do? What are some requirements? So I want to make an API that anyone can use, not just me. I want generalized support for a device so I can say, what devices are on your system? Identify them. Give me a name. I need to know what they are. Um, generalized settings. Pretty much everything you want on SDR, there's a lot of common patterns here. Frequency, gain, I want to set and get that. Rates, filters, um, sometimes, sometimes more advanced stuff, sample rate. Also, we need a streaming API. I need to be able to read and write chunks of samples. I want to support metadata and advanced uh, burst controls and time controls. And finally, minimal dependencies. So ideally, I want you to be able to <coughs> take this framework and just with a compiler be able to build it. Sure, if we pull in additional hardware uh, here or there, you're of course going to need their driver library. But minimally, you should be able to just build this framework against your application, and that's it. So follow that up. I want this to be a, a module or plugin based architecture. That means once everything's installed, hardware modules are essentially files that support your uh, particular piece of hardware, and you install them after the fact. And the, the driver API basically says, if I find this on my system, I'll be able to that, talk to him, I'll be able to enumerate devices, I'll be able to tell you about it. So this is how we can build applications off a very simple, sort of simple API. <clears throat> And then, and, then, and then we can basically query everything later. And finally, uh, I want to do permissive licensing. I want everyone to be able to use this new framework I'm going to make, whether it's open source, any of those licenses, or commercial, or you know, private or public use. We just want to make sure you can use it. So fast forward, now we have something called SOAPY SDR. This is what I put together to solve our framework issue. So we've got a C++ and C API. So you're very familiar with that. And of course, Python API, which is great. Everyone here loves Python. I love Python. The, be the best thing about Python is I can go ahead, I can immediately just type, type off in my like, Python terminal, open a device, configure it, see what's on there. It saves so much time. Second of all, very low boilerplate. I want people to be able to create, essentially, support modules underneath this system. And so, in reality, we, have, we provided a CMake macro and you just make a very simple CMake macro, call this macro with your source files. Generally, there's three files, typically a settings, which is your get and set frequency, fill it in, call your underlying driver, streaming, how do we read and write sample streams, and registration, how do we find the device? Most, if not all, of the SOAPY SDR projects basically look like this. And I can report now, as of this presentation, that nearly all of the uh, major SDR devices on the market actually have SOBI SDR support, which is amazing. Uh, special thanks to uh, Charles J. Cliff at Cubic SDR because he actually stepped in and produced a bunch of these because he had the same problem I did, is he needed to make an application and bring in SDR support. So this is clearly a niche we needed to take care of. So some interesting things about SOBI SDR is on top, of, on top of what I just talked of, we have some neat modules. One of them is SOBI Remote. So this means any device that you built into SOAPY SDR. You can now run the SOAPY Remote server on one end, and you install SOAPY Remote on a host or, host or PC side, and it transparently just shows up on your device. SOAPY Remote takes care of all the, all the tunneling for all the network controls and all the streams, and we, we try to do a high rate streaming a windowed protocol, and we talk TCP for all the basic controls. And so it's very transparent. Same API, whether it's Python, C, or whatever, works. And this has been very popular with a uh, 
some of the some of the embedded arms where you can plug in something like an RTL and get about two mega samples a second. We can certainly do better with a bigger PC, but that's just been a, a pretty pretty popular use case to get a quick sample stream over TCP for just about any device. We also have uh, SOAPy Multi SDR, and basically this is just a simple way to put a homogeneous group of devices into a single device handle with much wider channels because some some people want to work with an API where there's just many channels in one device. Um, and finally, because sometimes, sometimes we have a module very soon when a new hardware device comes out, and sometimes uh, GR Osmo SDR actually does, I've created SOAPy Osmo, which is essentially a project that can pull in the implementations inside GR Osmo SDR. And we don't pull in all of GNU Radio, we basically pull in the, the wrapper layers that talk to the underlying C library, and we build them into this project. It basically only pulls in Boost and whatever libraries were needed. I do need a water, by the way. If anyone could. Thank you. <clears throat> so I wanted to bring up some interesting use cases or idioms that came up now that we have this great tool. And one of the things you can do is whenever anyone makes a new device, um, they basically make this low-level C driver and, and ship that out and install it. But one of the neat things you can actually do is never have this low-level C API. You can actually build your entire module into a SOAPy SDR, or entire entire driver into SOAPy SDR module. Thank you so much. We have more humidity where I'm from in Houston. <clears throat> so no C API whatsoever. And this is pretty powerful because it means you can rapidly make a device, basically fill in hooks for streaming settings, and have it work in Python, have it work remotely. This is great when you're making a device, let's say it's on a zinc, and maybe your application is running actually on the arm, and he's responsible for like controls and stuff, and high-level controls, hitting registers, bumping spy, things like that. And further, with SOAPy SDR, we don't hide anything from you. So this actually gives you access to uh, SPY, I2C, UARDs, and we have an API for generic settings. We really don't want to ever hide anything. So we can get access to anything you basically need on the chips as long as you fill the hooks in. In fact, not only am I using this at my job at Skylark, but there's some people in the room who are also actually making use of this feature with SOAPy SDR for their hardware. Thank you. <clears throat> Also, when sample streams don't have to be just raw sample streams. Uh, the streaming API is actually capable of supporting things like uh, packets and bound arrays of bytes and FFTs. We have the correct flags to deal with that. So in your FPGA, you may not have raw stream data. You may have a decoder. You may have an FFT. And we support that use case as well. Uh, another neat thing that came up is there's a hybrid approach we can do here. And we did this with the, uh, the Skylark Iris hardware that, we, that I produced. Basically, uh, it was really nice to make an application that ran on the zinc to give us control of everything. And it was really nice to be able to test that and get bursts in and out. We brought up all the hardware that way. We couldn't do high rate streams over the ethernet. The arm's just not capable of it. But there's a hybrid approach where we used all the stuff we wrote with, with SOAPy SDR, SOAPy Remote, and we basically filled in the hooks a little differently for the streaming because we needed hardware acceleration. So it's possible to have the best of both worlds and just do the extra work you need to get the hardware streaming going. Everything else is already handled by SOAPy Remote. And finally, closing the loop. I think this is pretty interesting, but you can now make a device. It could work under SOAPy SDR. But we've also made a SOAPy module for GR Osmo SDR. So that means anything that's supported under SOAPy SDR, you don't have to go re make a new Osmo SDR module or anything like that. It just works so long as you've compiled it in. And any application built on GR Osmo SDR, quite a lot, like GQRX and GRC, just works. This is actually how we have Lime support for Lime SDR and other stuff under uh, Lime Suite software working within the GNU Radio environment. Also, just like there's a SOAPy UHD, and I know this is confusing, for supporting USERPs under the SOAPy SDR, we've done the reverse. We've also made UHD SOAPy, which is for supporting SOAPy supported drivers under UHD. And this is really nice because, of course, any, oh, there's a lot of stuff written against the UHD API. So now if you have something supported under SOAPy, it will work in UHD. Further, every, everyone benefits from open source software because what's really nice is a USERP user can go run SOAPy Remote Server and he can go over to his host PC and he can run UHD API and transparently use his USERP over the network with SOAPy SDR in the middle, ne never having actually touched it. It's pretty amazing. And one more story on that point. I was following the HackerOff mailing list and someone said, 
I can't UHD usurp probe or UHD find device as my RTL. Might have been Hackraft, might have been RTL. And someone had to explain, well, that's the wrong driver. But my reply to him is, you can do that now. So please feel free. You should be able to UHD usurp probe your RTL SDR. OK. I'm, I may have confused some people. I'm talking about layer, layers, drivers, and arrows. So I've made a graph. Basically, I just want to point out where things kind of exist in this ecosystem. I put a lot of work into cleaning this up. If you notice something's missing or the arrows don't all connect, I did my best. It was really hard to get a graph is to work. But here we have the green block, SOAPI SDR in the middle. And we can see how we can build applications on top of it. We have Cubic SDR, for example. We can see where SOAPI SDR ties into GR Osmos DR. We can also see where I brought it into Pothos toolkits to get source and sync uh, SDR blocks there. Now this box of uh, purple is essentially uh, most of the modules out there. There's, of course, more. And these are things you would optionally install if you wanted to support a particular piece of hardware. And there we can see Skylark Iris. That's my company. We can see how uh, Lime fits in there. We have a, something called SOAPI LMS. And it's sitting with, uh, you can see Lime Suite. Uh, the, the blue is basically a C, uh, C drivers column. And those two things are actually bundled together here. Although in most cases, all these blue, all these blue columns are typically bundled separately, but we could put them together. Um, and then you can see how UHD fits in. We have UH, UHD going into several GNU radio APIs, as well as the SOAPI UHD. And here we can see how in the UHD plugins, UHD SOAPI also fits in there, and that's how we close that loop. So can anyone think of a device that's kind of like an SDR? It has a sample rate, but it's really slow. It's an audio card. Now, I just wanted to find a similar graph for the uh, Linux audio system, and this is kind of a famous graph. Now, don't, don't judge it too much. I spent a lot of time making my arrows, uh, but you know, Linux audio is no stranger to uh, abstraction layers. And it looks as if anytime someone wanted to support audio, they made their own layer. And I mean, I think that's fair. Uh, you know, we have, we have a few things here. We have SOAPI SDR, we have GNU Radio. But uh, to me, this is sort of like, where do we draw the line? Uh, wh wh what's good practice? Um, maybe they went a bit overboard. So I'm just saying there's a balance here. Uh, I think I tried to fill a niche in the ecosystem. I think sometimes this paradigm can go a little too far. Um, but, and the other interesting thing is, this entire chart actually ties in to here. So it's part of one much bigger rat's nest. In fact, audio ties into a number of places within the SDR ecosystem. Just a little story of interest. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about Lime Suite, because I'm here, I'm here representing Lime. So first of all, I got to say that Lime Suite is here to support the Lime SDR, but it's actually much, much more than that. We have a number of other devices actually supported inside of the Lime Suite right now. There's PCIe-based boards. There's a, a RF board for using the LMS 7002M RFIC on an open uh, Novena laptop. There's some other stream and eval boards supported as well. But we've also, it's not just one giant C glob uh, to support all this stuff. We've actually made an effort to sort of architect the library so there's different reusable components. Because basically, we want you to be able to reuse as much of this as possible in your own device. So Lime, is, Lime Suite basically has a similar API to do settings on the device, with, but with the Lime RFIC and to enumerate devices. So basically, anything supported under Lime Suite is going to have what comes with it, a high-level C API. Um, we have Python 2, automatic support under SOAPI SDR, and therefore the entire stack, including GR Osmo SDR. <clears throat> that's brought in under the uh, SOAPI LMS block. And um, it's actually, un unlike many C drivers, this actually comes with a, a fairly neat evaluation GUI. So we're capable of doing high level and low level controls, live FFTs, and you can get drill all the way down to the bit and wiggle it around and try to get that you know, perfect response, or so be it. So let's whittle that, let's whittle that down some more. So, Lime Suite has a, has, a, has a fairly robust C API that's capable of like enumerating and streaming and configuring just about any board that's supported under there. We also offer some hardware specific stuff so we can do FPGA programming, other low level controls. 
It comes with a GUI that's tremendous for debugging. You can do red, I'm having a problem. You can dump all the registers. You can go in and zoom in and wiggle the bits. So this has been an incredibly useful tool for development. And so what we want you to be able to do is, well, our designs are open hardware. Our FPGA designs are open. We want you to be able to take this design and modify it for your own purposes. So it's possible to plug into Line Suite. This is why we compartmentalize things and pull them apart so you can make the best reuse out of them. So what we've done is we have a C++ API in this case where you can overload a few calls and essentially um, tell it how to get access to registers. Tell it how to stream. You have a Lime RFIC on here. It knows how to talk to it. It knows how to translation all those register calls into high level you know, set gain, set frequency, tune, sample rate, all that. And it saves a lot of time because you can just have that working out of the box pretty much so long as it has spy access. Uh, to go a little further on that, you may, you may choose to mix and match things. Um, what are you going to put in your FPGA core? How's it going to connect to the bus? One of the things we have is reusable FPGA cores. So going a little further, if you drop our streaming core into your FPGA, you can reuse the LMS64C protocol. And this is even simpler. Tell it how to get bytes in and out. If it's libUSB, how do we get uh, block writes in and out of it? Um, or similar for PCIe or whatever. And he's going to be able to, at the driver level, he knows how to form, the, form packets in and out, control bits, register packets, streaming, whatever it is. And in the FPGA level, he knows how to interpret that. He knows how to interact with the high-speed data IQ lines. He knows how to do controls. He knows how to talk to the RFIC. And you get all of that. So if you can reuse these parts, you'll get it. It'll work in line suite. You'll have this excellent debug GUI. And you know, it just works. SOPI SDR, the whole stack, it's there. So I hope you get a lot of reuse out of all these, these great open hardware and open, other open firmware and FPGA designs. Uh, a few other items of interest with Lime Suite. We have a Python driver, which is pretty cool. I love Python. And I think a lot of people here do too. And so someone was nice enough to make a uh, vec uh, scalar vector network analyzer example on top of Python. Basically, we wanted to show it off. And you can see a Smith chart there that was generated by the Lime SDR. Also, um, in tandem with this development, at Skylark, we've produced a open source embeddable C driver. So you know, if you're not into shared libraries or you need something very tiny, in this case, we needed to fit something into a kernel. We created a C driver. It's not as exciting, of course. It doesn't do, it doesn't do high level streaming. There's not a lot of extraction. But essentially, if you tell this tiny driver how to talk to Spy, he gives you higher level C calls for all the most important stuff you need on the board, like tuning, setting sample rates, and other configuration like that. And the driver's available on Myriad RF. All right. Final, uh, finally, I'd like to talk a bit about some of the packaging efforts we've done at Myriad, Myriad RF, because we like to be able to bring you, uh, in whatever form we can, all of these great driver and uh, SDR stacks, all the way from the low level C drivers up to GNU Radio. And this isn't just about uh, Lime SDR. We try to package everything in that, in that chart, basically. Every C driver we can, and sort of any GNU Radio project that gets requested. So we have three major efforts going on. And one of them is using Launchpad, which is a uh, Ubuntu service to package devs. Another are Ubuntu snaps, which I'd like to get into about uh, how we can create a transactional package and share an entire software stack. And finally, we have a uh, Windows installer that I've created that we host over at Myriad RF that sort of brings everything in that chart as well into a single installer. Let's talk a bit about software packaging. So uh, this is specific to Ubuntu. But I noticed at some point that Ubuntu is always out of date in terms of packages. Does anyone else notice that? So you have an older Ubuntu release. And at the time it was released, it had the latest version of uh, GNU Radio, UHD, you name it. Um, gets a little stale over time. And I, I kind of noticed that. It, it was difficult. And I said, let's have, let's have a repo with like a PPA with the most up-to-date drivers, the most up-to-date GNU Radio we can. And I fished around a bit. I noticed Alex from GQRX had a little microcosm of this, where he was actually personally maintaining a PPA with a whole bunch of drivers, and just basically in GNU Radio, just for GQRX. I said, hey, I think everyone can use this. I could certainly use this. I'd like, to, I'd like to basically expand on this. So let's take this over to Myriad RF. Let's make a really up-to-date repository for all the Ubuntu releases and LTS releases. Let's put GNU Radio on there. Let's put drivers on there. Let's put SOPI SDR on there. Let's put all the modules I worked on with SOPI SDR as well. And so we have that now. You know, special thanks. You, you, great help. Um, if anyone's interested in using these, you got the um, 
PPA up there. Please use them. Please test them. Uh, make requests. When new stuff comes out, you know, Alex, he tries, he tries to get the latest stuff uploaded. He tries to get the latest branch of GR Osmo SDR with everything in there. We basically need people to help test, say if there's a problem, say, hey, did you notice this new package? Let's put it up. So we're trying to keep that maintained as best we can. I love Ubuntu devs, but sometimes they can be difficult. And so I want, I want to complain a little bit about the devs too. Has anyone ever installed some Ubuntu packages and left a lot of stuff in user local and then there was some seg fault and you never knew why? Happens to me all the time. Yeah, it's just rm-rf user local to solve all the problems. But th these, are, these are things that can happen. Devs aren't perfect. Uh, they're meant to be installed in user local and stuff can interfere if it's in your library path. And uh, you know, Dependencies sometimes are missing and things can be difficult. You know, we, we try our best to keep package stuff that sometimes can be radio pulled in a new library. What do we have to do? We have to backport all the dependencies. So it can be hard. And if you mix and match PPAs, like if you use this PPA up here, it's built on a really new version of UHD. You're going to also have to add the Edis PPA or it'll say fault. So uh, devs aren't perfect. They have some of these problems. So what I want to talk a bit about is another thing from Ubuntu. Oh, snap, it's Ubuntu snaps. So what is a snap? It's essentially a blob that has an entire software stack in it. And you can share it, you can install it, and you'll get um, basically everything you needed to run that. And there won't be any conflicts. It lives in a little compartment. And so and snaps are also transactional packages, which means you can, you can add a new, install a new one, you can remove them. They're very good about cleaning up after themselves. So you never get conflicts between multiple versions, and you're able to swap between them. So, I mean, this, this is actually great because anyone here can essentially make a snap, share it with someone, and give them an entire software stack without worrying how it's going to work on their particular machine or crash. Um, building a snap is as simple as a single YAML file. Does anyone here like YAML? It's better than JSON? I don't know. But <clears throat> you basically say, hey, I want to build this project. Here's its name. Here's all its dependencies. What are dependencies? You can use packages from the PPA that are already in Ubuntu. You give it a list of GitHub projects, particular branches, because you may need a very specific version of something, and say Snapcraft, and it builds. It'll build everything from source that you need in there, pull it in, and give you a .snap file. And these are easy to deal with. There's a single file I can put on a USB stick, I can share it, I can put it up on a web server. There's also an option to share it through Ubuntu. They have a, a Snap store. We actually have LimeNet. Over with Lime, we're basic, we want to make it easy for people to upload packages and share them. It's not necessarily a store. You can put completely free packages on it. It's just a place to share it and let Ubuntu do the hosting. So what I've done with Snaps is over at Myriad RF, we have the Snapcraft sandbox. It's got a ton of examples, basically using Lime Suite and GNU Radio and SOBI SDR software stacks. It's got three major different types of examples. We have graphical examples, which means if you want an app like GQRX, it has all, it has all the examples to um, basically not only build what you need, but to put like the nice icons and the launchers in. I'm very detail oriented. We also command line style examples. So, hey, I need to build this app and I just need the utility I'm gonna run. You can do that too. And server style, which is actually neat. You can, let's say you're using Soapy Remote, you can install this package and what it does is automatically launch the service for you. As long as that package is installed, it's actually running the server it was built with. It makes it very easy. You don't have to set up any init.com files or anything like that. It's all expressed in YAML. And then finally, uh, moving on to the evil side of things, I'd like to talk a bit about a Windows install I've been maintaining. You know, sometimes we have to use Windows. Now, my goal here was basically I wanted to put everything in that giant graph <clears throat> into a Windows installer to make it easy to uh, point, click, install, and run stuff. Uh, this is no easy challenge. At this point in time, Nearly everything's in there. We have something like 50, 60 software packages that we're building from source. Um, you know, entire GNU Radio, entire GQRX, um, some, some uh, GR Star projects, everything I did with Pothos, everything with Lime Suite, everything with SOAP SDR, lots of dependencies like GSL. I try to build as much as I can. It's basically a big CMake project, so it's totally open. Everyone, anyone can take it and modify it and add stuff too. So we just, with a lot of CMake external projects, we give you the Git branch, we give you the version, and it's able to build this. We've actually been able to keep the installer under 80 megabytes, which is a big thing I wanted to do. I was like, I want to keep this small. So 
Basically, they meant we didn't ship boost development files and Qt development files and some Python, and that keeps it down. So this is all the development files and development libraries you'd ever need with this entire ecosystem, with the exception of boost, because depending upon your use, you might not need Python. So you can install this, um, you can install this thing. Um, maybe you have to put in a driver for your SDR. We have a tutorial on that. Go to the start menu and click GTRX. It's just gonna work, it just opens. The launcher's all set up. But if you're gonna do something else, like maybe use GRC, you might need some particular Python dependencies, like an interpreter. Or if you're gonna develop against GNU Radio Blocks, yeah, you have to go grab Boost and install it. It's really big, it's like a gig. I didn't wanna ship the same Boost with every single installer. I make these once a week. Um, <clears throat> we try to be very detail-oriented here. So this is very, in the, the idea is to be a one-click wonder. So everything we can try to set up beforehand, we do. So when the installer runs, we have Python, modules for the new radio, we have Python modules for Sophie SDR. So we set, maybe make sure we set the Python module pass, so damn, as soon as you install it, boom, you can import Python from the new radio and et cetera. Uh, we also did everything we could to set up like launchers and stuff, so this means all the icon associations work. You can double click the save icon, it'll open GRC. Um, I basically put a ton of work into this personally and I've watched Swig compile way more than I ever wanted to, so I just wanted to share the amount of effort that kind of went into this. We all, um, and sort of debugging here was like real pain. I remember way back when, when you know, GNU Radio, someone type depth a pointer to long. And that's 32 bits on some 64-bit machines. And it was just crashing. And it took me all day to figure that out. Uh, I also, I also really like to thank, uh, I believe it's Jeff now who maintains the Windows install. He's been tremendous to like upload tons of stuff and also also help in keeping GNU Radio maintained under Windows. It's been really a big deal. Uh, I also want to mention I made a little clever GNU Radio companion launcher just for this project. So it's an EXE that actually loads the underlying Python, but it sanity checks your environment. So if you're missing modules, it'll go fetch it. If you don't have particular environment variables set up, if you really wanted to get the one click thing working. So anyway, check it out. Sorry to bore you about Windows. We have a tutorial. We also have a link to GNU Radio, so you can, you can uh, set that up from there. So that's my talk. So in summary, SDR is built on a diverse set of drivers and APIs churning under the hood. I hope I sort of open that world up a little bit. SOPI SDR is a cool and versatile tool for the SDR community. I hope it actually solved a niche or a problem here. It certainly did for me and some of my developments. Um, you know, Lime Suite is there for anything using the LMS 7002M. It makes it really easy to develop applications and reuse as much code and hardware as possible. And finally, we have a number of packaging efforts over at Myriad RF, PPA, Snaps, and Windows installers. I hope you make good use of them. Uh, so thanks for watching. And uh, just questions or comments, if there's any time left. Yeah, we do have a few, and we already have some hands up. All right, uh, Jose, can you get to Nathan? And uh, actually, Michelle, if you want to come and start getting mic'd. Uh, so I'm not real familiar with all the different uh, Snap and Docker type container things. Why would you choose Snaps, or what advantage do Snaps over have over the other sort of? Well, I thought I could ask for this. Uh, it's a, it's a. There's a lot of options out there. This is one that I picked and just learned and wanted to share about because that's sort of what we went along with. I'm sure Docker's good too. I also I'm just a big fan of Ubuntu stuff, and this is something. We kind of we were working with Lime, Lime and uh, Lime SDR, Meteor RF, and we just went ahead and did snaps. Um, for what it's worth, they're pretty easy. Any other questions? I've got a, I've got a couple. Uh, you talked a little bit about licenses. Uh, you talked about the license for I think um, Soapy. What's the license for Lime Suite? Uh, Apache two. Apache two. Okay. And then my second question, actually, kind of along the same lines as Nathan. Uh, do you really see a difference between, this is more the container question, uh, in radio, right, we talk a lot about installation and how to make it easier. Uh, so it looks like you've done a lot of work with snaps. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how those might be applied, either snaps, I think uh, uh, the GNU project has their own version called flat packs, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then there's, there's obviously Docker. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how that could be applied to GNU radio? Well, so I think the, the main idea of a snap is I try to think of it as an application or a particular use case. So whereas when I made the Windows installer, I tried to package everything in there I could, you're really building a snap for one case. And it's not necessarily even meant to work for everything under the sun all at once. It's, you know, it's, it's containerized, it has certain protections, it doesn't really want to do that. In fact, you may have an issue creating like simultaneous WX, uh, Python, and like QT launchers for all the stuff. So 
yes, if you have an app you want to share with someone, in this case. I actually think it's not that applicable for doing, I want to share a development library with you. Hmm. That's a little bit different. I want to share an app, oh, and a lot of people do want apps. You know, they want to be able to launch something. Whether it be just GRC and I want to design and make Python, that's actually very applicable. And we do have a snap for that. Okay. Or GQRX too, right? Very cool. Things of that nature. All right, any other questions for Josh? No? Oh, we have one more. And <laughs> sorry, oh, did I? One minute left. Sorry, I, I should have pointed better. Sure. Just like you said, sometimes we have no choice but to work with Windows. Um, the boost libraries are a pain. I could tell you, as you know. There is a Teeks 99, has a pre-compiled EXEs. I was just wondering if you would pull those in. Pre-compiled so EXEs for boost? Yeah, on Windows. I believe I am using them. Yeah, I, I know too, but you're, you're saying you don't pull them into the uh, I, install. I was just wondering, I it's nice to have everything in Windows just work because it usually doesn't. So we, we ship the boost runtime libraries. What I don't ship is the .libs for development and the headers. And I mean, that they're really, really big. I yeah, just, no, that's fine, okay. I but, didn't but understand. We tell, I tell you what version of Boost, and you can actually go download it, and you, Should be there's good. there's always yeah. a little bit of work if you're gonna go compile something, because you have to point to the right headers and all that, but. Okay, I didn't that understand. Was the, that was the trade-off, essentially. Yeah, no, no, it was good. Sounds good, thanks. All right, thank you, Josh. Cool, thank you. I'm just gonna pop that one off and leave it here. All right, so next up, we are going to kick off our Hacking Challenge for the week. Uh, this was led by Michelle Thompson. Michelle is one of our organizers. Um, actually, gonna raise a hand for people who know Michelle. Yeah. yeah, you do. Yeah, so if you have a, a, a amateur radio, a, the AWRL handbook, you open to like page six, there's a picture of Michelle. Uh, so we're very, very happy to have her here. Uh, she's worked really hard on the Hacking Challenge. And then after, we're actually not going to take a full half hour here. So once she's done, I'll make a few announcements, and then we'll, we'll break for lunch just a little bit early. Yeah. Thank you. The, I'm here to talk about the CTF, uh, Capture the Flag format, so Wireless Hacking Challenge. There are challenges scattered all over. On this side of the room, there's a variety of challenges, and there is some in the lobby behind registration, and we are looking for more. So if you have ever wanted to prank somebody with GNU Radio and make them figure something out, we are here to help you make that happen. So we already have a, an additional Bluetooth challenge uh, that's somewhere out there uh, that someone really wanted to, uh, to show off. Um, so it's gonna run all week, and there is a server our first challenge to you was to find the server, and we found out that that challenge was a bit too hard, and I'll let you in on the secret. We were gonna put a QR code using GR Paint uh, wedged in between some of the Wi-Fi channels, but we cannot get a big enough footprint for everybody to see it. So, the CTF server is written down in actual English, and it is correct. It's at the registration booth, so you can, as you, as you go out, just where the Wi-Fi password is, the CTF server is listed there. You can register yourself, and dive right in. Uh, most of the challenges are up. We're working really hard to get them up throughout the afternoon, and there'll be more throughout the week. So if you guys rip through them all, we've got more in mind. So that's one activity that's going on this week. Another activity, something kind of new, is on Friday, we have an amateur radio exam scheduled. Uh, we are very lucky in San Diego County. Exams are free here through SANDARC, uh, San Diego Amateur Radio Council. And their VE team will be here Friday morning, uh, right after registration closes to uh, 1210 or so. And so if you are interested in getting your amateur radio license, we are here to help you. If you notice, some people have been blessed with Hello Kitty on their, um, on their badges. Those people have signed up in advance and indicated an interest. We have the Form 604s or 605s here. Uh, and we will help you get your FRN, the number from FCC to track you through your license experience. Uh, we can help you find uh, test taking support and we will cheer you on all week. The biggest advantage to getting your license is that you can then transmit some of these crazy ideas that you come up with in GNU Radio. And SDRs are huge in amateur radio. It's a big and growing area of experimentation uh, and it's just a lot of fun. There's a large number of social activities and contests and all sorts of other things. So any questions uh, for either one of those activities, uh, either speak up now or come find me at registration, I'll be there. 
All right, do we have any questions? Oh, sorry, I'm holding that really close, I realize. Uh, do we have any questions about the hacking challenge specifically, which starts now, right? Is it everything's on now, right? Yep. Okay. Um, this is going to be kind of awkward because it's a lava layer. Yeah, what, what was the FCC number on the bottom of the microphone there, Michelle, again? <laughs> <laughs> You should, oh, you should give it to somebody scratched it off. <laughs> Man, it's almost like they're on to you. No, I, I will say, last year, nobody successfully cracked the, the digital mics. That sounds so, like a challenge. Yeah, Sylvain, Sylvain broke the analog mics, I think, within the first couple hours. Uh, but I think we're all digital this year. I, the AV team's looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> all right, any other questions about the hacking challenge? Oh, we got one from Richard. Oh, Jose, can you get him? I'm just wondering if it means that can one person win all the challenges now, or is it there's going to be multiple different winners? It's a so it's CTF format, which means that there's a number of challenges, and each of them have a, a value, and you accrue points. You can do it individually if you want, or you can form up a little team. So just whatever name you pick for your team or your individual name, and that's how they're, they're tracked on the website. And as long as our little server hangs in there, it'll, you know, if there's any problems with the server, just bug me and I'll go kick it. Uh, but yes, one person can, can win the whole thing. There's, uh, I have four prizes right now, and uh, you know, if anybody wants to donate more, I'm happy to hand them out. Uh, so uh, does that answer the question about the scoring? Yeah, uh, thanks for reminding me. I have a number of RTL SDRs for loan if you didn't bring an SDR. Now, some of the challenges are above the frequency range of the RTL SDR, uh, but these are loans and they can be a gift if you really, really like it and want to take it home. Uh, you know, just owe me uh, some, some goodwill and all that. Uh, so if you need an RTL SDR to go scout out uh, most of the challenges, then just come to me in the registration area and I will hand you one. We don't have an unlimited supply. Uh, we've already loaned out a few, but they're there in case you want to participate or just see what's out there. Any other questions? Ends Friday. Yeah, Friday afternoon. What are the prizes? They're California-themed prizes. Oh, you get your very own bear. <laughs> there actually may be a bear on one or two of them. That's not legal in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I'll vouch for you. I'll vouch for you. We'll figure something out. All right, any other questions about the hacking challenge? No? Any questions about the ham radio exam? Nope, all right, I think we're good. Thank you, Michelle. You are welcome. All right. I'll All right, so I have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, for everyone here who is registered as a student, uh, students only, and actually, if you could uh, send, it back to my, send it back to my laptop at any point, it's fine. Um, anyone who's registered uh, as a student, uh, Analog Devices is giving away flu free Pluto SDRs to students only, uh, but if you wanna go check one out, you can see them in the booth. So Robin Getz, if you don't know Robin, you can raise, this, raise your hand. This is Robin. If you're a student, go talk to Robin. He has cool SDRs for you. Uh, so this afternoon is when we break into a double track conference. Uh, this is the first time that we've really done this. Uh, so if you have any questions, please let me know. The second track today is a series of tutorials. Remember that the program is wrong. The tutorials are in Shell today, this afternoon, not Del Mar in the shell room, which if you remember is on stage left. To the, if you're looking at the check-in or the lobby, the hotel lobby is to the left of that. Damar is to the right. Um, so tutorials will be in there. The rest of the technical conference is in here. Uh, so when we come back, we're going to kick it off, I think. If you're ready to get blasted by um, math equations and code, uh, be here after lunch. Um, lunch is down there in the pond where the seals are. Uh, I actually didn't realize they were live seals when I first saw them, but they are indeed live seals. Uh, and lastly, anyone who has questions to submit for the panel tonight, please, please, please get them to me before the end of lunch. Uh, we need time to not only make sure that you wrote crazy stuff, or that you didn't write crazy stuff, but to combine questions that are mostly the same into one question. 
Um, so please get them to me by the end of lunch. If you need index cards, they're spread out across the tables. Uh, and with that, we are going to go ahead and, and head out for a break. Uh, please remember you can exit on either side of the building. Please don't wait in line forever for the elevators. There's a big staircase past the elevators, and there's stairs over there as well. Thanks.